Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Glucon Weekly. Joining us this week is Ian Richardson, a consultant in Fox and Crowd Group, an expert in entrepreneurship and uh, startups and everything that is around uh, scaling and selling businesses for entrepreneurs. So thank you for joining us, Ian. Yeah, yeah. Um, great, to, great to be here, Luca. Uh, Ian on Ian on the name and uh, super excited to be talking about communication and, and teams and team building. Welcome. Well, uh, first of all, you'd like to start with a quick introduction about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Ian Richardson, I owned and operated a managed services provider in the mid Michigan region. For those of you familiar with Michigan, we navigate by hand and I was right here. Hmm. And uh, we were healthcare specific, so dealing with a lot of doctors and nurses and hospital systems, things like that. Uh, ran it for 16 years, sold it, and now I am a management consultant who helps folks in the tech space scale and sell their business. This is a great, uh, I think it's a great value position because in the tech space, a lot of people know how to start a business. We all know how to build even a good product that would bust with it. Like many people have. Good products, they actually work and they do something useful and you fail around something else. So it is a hundred percent. It's uh you get a lot of these really, really incredibly intelligent people who hop in, who have have a product, have a have an idea for a service, but business acumen and leadership and management skills, say even a sales skill set might be uh, weak or absent. And you, you've got this awesome idea, but it flounders because of the lack of the uh, the soft skill side of things. What do you think, in fact, uh, well, what do you think of what you have encountered in your experience are the main failure factors in startups and companies? Yeah. Um, so. There's a, it, it's interesting, rarely, uh, I, and I can speak from the, from the technology space. That's, that's, that's my background, but at my old MSP and as well as a fairly universal experience across, uh, MSPs in the, in the North American channel, there's a few challenges that recur. So the entrepreneur sells instinctively in their own, in their own messaging strategy, but a lot of organizations fail to, to move sales away from that principle. So there's kind of this transference of, of the narrative, transference of how to talk about the business, how to talk about value proposition. And you get a lot of uh, another really, really common one is, is as that CEO or the founder or even co-founders grow and the business grows, their, their focus has to shift. They have to start doing different things. And there's a lot of struggle transferring that management of people off of the entrepreneur's desk. So if they're not managing their technical team or they're not managing their their professional services team, whatever it might be, a lot of that promotion comes from within. We're entrepreneurs. We love to reward those who, who served us well. But you're then promoting someone who's got a lot of technical talent who, again, might not have those soft skills and managerial skills. So you, those are two really, really common challenges is how do you how do you build up leaders and how can you successfully transfer the, the messaging of the business from the entrepreneur to anyone else? Yeah, you know, the, especially the latter, I think is very, very important, both on two sides. One is just the training and finding the right people, but especially sometimes, and I've seen that happen a lot of times, you have the right person, but you don't communicate with them correctly. That they, uh, I think that the, probably, let me say it's probably the main issue at most startups, people not talking to each other. A hundred percent agree. Um, if you think about it, we all, our, our personality really gets made up of three things, right? There, there's what you're born with. Like you, you, you've got some genetic factors that go into personality. You'll have some traits from your, from your parents that kind of pass down. There's those environmental factors, how you grow up, especially if there's trauma in the background. Those can traumatic events, loss of a parent or, or some sort of abuse can really shape a personality. And then there's the behavior on really how we choose to respond to the, that first and second point. But across the world, you're going to view a set of circumstances and data and, and people 
in your own way. And there might be a lot of people who come to the same conclusion, but there's about three quarters of the population that are going to have a fundamental different viewpoint of the same situation and data. And if we only talk the way that we would want to be talked to, if we only communicate the way that we think is important about the things that we value, we're losing the right to lead and influence and communicate with three quarters of the population. And that's that's where the struggle is, is the entrepreneur is saying A in this way, and the person over here sees B and they see it in an entirely different point of view. And so you, you get this conflict. And once you, it's not an impossible challenge to solve, but it does require everyone to kind of lean in and say, okay, what can I control? What can I control? Well, Luca, I can't change you, but I can change the way I communicate to you. So I can serve you better so that I can be of service to you better, which is what leadership's all about. So let's assume a classic scenario, which can be really interesting. Classic co-founder, super technical or pair of co-founders, both out of Stanford or whatever, programmers, mm -hmm. they're great, they build something very interesting. Now they're trying to scale. And every time they hire a salesperson, uh, that salesperson ends up even leaving. I've seen that happen to you. Because they literally not, they don't understand what's going on. They, they, they can't talk to each other. How do you start fixing that? Yeah, so sales especially, I'm, I'm very passionate about. I'm a self-admitted sales junkie. Mm -hmm. And the, the first thing that really is a, uh, a critical failure is those co-founders will hire this salesperson and say, okay, this sales rep has a long, long record of success. They're able to sell well. We know that they can do that. They're, they're well put together. They're a good communicator. Let's give, them the, let's give them the blank sheet of paper and they'll build a sales engine. And people who build systems and processes are not the same people who sell stuff. So a lot of the times right out of the gate, those co-founders are just hiring a sales rep and expecting them to be more of a sales organization designer. That's two different skill sets. That, that sales, sales rep would thrive. Yeah. If they would enable them with a process. <laughs> you know, I never thought about it that way, but you're really right. As an engineer, as a, as a, a technical founder, maybe the assumption is I'm going to hire someone who's going to work like an engineer. So when I hire an engineer and tell them I need a new web page that does this and that, and they'll go and build it. The assumption is you hire a salesperson and tell them I need a sales organization and they'll come back with a sales org. And that's, that's not the skill set. The best sales reps are terrible process builders. They're people builders. They form relationships. They can, read, they can read emotions. They can read body language. They're able to form rapport and get people to unload their fears, uncertainties, and doubts onto them. And then they can say, hey, like you've got this problem. Here's the impact of the problem. Here's how we could help. And they can create that belief because people don't buy logically. You can't send a spec sheet at someone and, and drown them in technical items and have them make a decision. People don't think that way. They think about, do I believe that this individual or this company can help me solve my problems? Do they understand me? Do they understand what I want? Can they help me? And if you can't get that belief, you're never going to be able to sell. So it's never a, a question of the skill. Like, I mean, sometimes they're just bad sales reps. Sure. Yeah. But 80% of the time, it's not the rep's problem. It's the owner's problem because they haven't set up the system and trained the rep. This is the way you sell the product. The rep needs to know the cycle on how you go through and that process. And then they'll execute on it again and again and again and again and make a windfall. But you can't ask them to start from zero. That's not their skill set. That's very. So, what does the technical founder need to learn to? relates to salespeople? So um, the first thing is really to, to take a step back. Um, those, those technical founders are, they love technology. But for every one person who loves technology, there's someone who doesn't care about technology. And there's probably two people who really don't like technology. So again, three quarters of the world view technology differently. And so take the tech terms out of it and talk about the business items that are going on. So if, if you're trying to relate to a salesperson, you say, look, we sell software. 
And the software is an accounting system. And there's a couple of pain points we found with accountants. Here's one, here's two, here's three. Here's how you can, here's how those manifest. Here's the usual range of costs. Here's what the feelings it looks like. Here's how it impacts the business. And our software solves it by eliminating this and giving the data so that this isn't a concern anymore and doing this. But you're not using any technical speak, no mumbo jumbo, because the buyers most times aren't going to be technical. If you have a highly technical buyer or, or your product's bought by highly technical people, then you need a technical sales rep or a sales engineer alongside the sales rep. And that's fine. But, you know, most of the time it is more around having those conversations with, uh, with individuals about business problems, about business impacts and not, uh, focusing so much on the technology piece of it. So. That's like, that's the number one thing. And then I, tech people are generally bad communicators and I don't like to paint with a broad brush, but we kind of live behind screens and ones and zeros and acronyms and stuff like that. So eliminating jargon and kind of leaning into saying like, Hey, I really want to, if you view it instead of a, a problem, it's this opportunity. I've got an opportunity to tell my story better and to talk to people better. A lot of tech people like that. They like a challenge. So like, this isn't a problem. It's an opportunity. Like, let's go conquer this mountain of communication. As a technical person, I have, I have experienced exactly what you're describing. To me, sometimes a problem is solved when I've written it up in a GitHub ticket. And then everything else is just doing the motions that get me to fixing it. But not everybody will understand. And there's a lot of technical stuff in there. It's not described well enough. So there's, there's a lot of work there. And there's another angle I'd like to ask you about. Uh, as companies grow, and especially in the current job climate, where it's not like it's not 2001 anymore. Uh, there's been a lot of round of tech layoffs recently. So there's a lot of uh, talent switching companies. There's a lot of age difference in companies that used to mm -hmm. not be the case, in my opinion. I remember companies being far more homogeneous, even just what, 15 years ago, everybody was within 10 years. Now you have 40-year-old founder, 60-year-old head engineer, and 20-year-old head designer. And they get in the same room. They hate each other at the start, like just by looking at each other. What is that guy doing? <laughs> and that's yeah, the, um, it's, it's so interesting because if you think about the history of the world, there's always been 80-year-olds and there's always been 20-year-olds. So the, the experience that we're all having with, hey, we're struggling to communicate with different generations is, is not a new challenge. It's a challenge that's been going on for a while. There is, uh, there is nothing but that challenge, and it's, it's going to repeat for forever. Um, so uh, the, uh, sorry, um, there's, there's, uh, the, the, the issue really stems, again, from personality differences and background differences, more so than like, hey, a 70-year-old or a 60-year-old can't talk to a 20-year-old or a 30-year-old. The 60-year-old has this run of experiences. They've been around the block many times. They're seasoned in the workforce. They've been through budget crunches, they've been through layoffs, they've been through payroll issues, finance issues, service issues, they, like they've seen it. They've seen it all. And so like they come to a table with that perspective. And a younger generation may not have seen all of that, they might not have all of that experience. But what they have is this wide eyed perspective of this is new. They'll ask the questions that someone hasn't asked before that's assumed. And so you've got this 60 year old person who might have a 30 year old sales rep, the 60 year old person. Uh, well, of course, it's X, Y, Z. That's the story. But the 30 year old person says, well, why is it X, Y, Z? Tell oh, me why. Explain exactly. why. And, and so if we can walk in saying, hey, every question is it comes from if someone's asking a question, they're not questioning me. They're not saying I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm not going to get defensive by it. And then lean into curiosity, that can help. 
And then just learning about the other person first. So who are you, 30-year-old? Who are you, 60-year-old? What's How do you like to communicate? How do you like feedback? What's important to you? What do you value? And if you have this big visionary 30-something-year-old speaking with a more people-oriented image presentation, I want everyone to love me and, and I want to love everyone, 30-year-olds, well, that's fine. The The 60-year-old can allow some excitability and focus on image presentation or even invite them to say, hey, how, do, how should we make this look? And the 30-year-old can lean in and say like, okay, I, I need to make sure that I'm focused on the big picture when I'm talking to the 60-year-old. So both parties are trainable and teachable and uh, instilling that common language and common understanding really helps remove the barriers. And, and tools like that are generationally independent like it, it works for a 20 year old and it'll work for a 70 year old you just gotta you gotta create that common language one thing it really feel like hasn't worked in my experience and i might be wrong is people trying to speak the other's language in this case it doesn't work like i prefer someone who's in a certain age group and experience group to keep speaking like their, their own age group Instead of, uh, well, there's always the joke of, you know, was it Steve Buscemi wearing <laughs> clothes, young kids clothes and just showing up at skateboard? That's extreme, mm -hmm. but that very often doesn't work. I've seen it try to happen and it never works. Yeah, so if, I, if I'm um, speak language, let me, uh, let me put a quantifier. I'm not saying that, hey, if you're 70, you should start talking about how you ate a topic and, and, and saying how much riz you have. <laughs> like we're we're not talking about um using slang and 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 different different generational vernacular, but understanding a a thirty year old who's focused on image and presentation or focused on primary leadership or or focused in what has a certain set of drivers and comfort zones and a personality style. Well, a 70-year-old with the same set of drivers and personality style and, and comfort zones can relate to them. Hey, I'm motivated by a blank sheet of paper. You know what? So am I. What's your favorite way to brainstorm? Oh, well, I do this. Wow, I do this, right? You can find some commonalities. And even if they're diametrically opposed, so you have a, a life of the party person here and a quality-oriented process person here, well, if they understand themselves and understand how the other person is wired, you can meet in the middle. And that doesn't mean vernacular and, and, and lingo and, and trying to ride a skateboard or whatever, right? It, it's more around where do, how does this person like to be communicated to? How do you affirm them or validate them? How do you give feedback to them? And how can I move myself to meet them where they're at? And if both parties are moving towards the middle, then neither one is is getting like way I'm um, way out of my comfort zone and way out of the comfort zone. We're both kind of moving a bit, and that's where communication happens. So it comes with more of awareness and a willingness to say like, okay, I'll move towards this person. Yeah. First of all, I think using a skateboard of an example of being young probably dates me too much. So <laughs> <laughs> right now, everybody you see with a skateboard is thirty five something. So it is. It's really, it's really the wrong example, but whatever, it works. Well, yeah, the, you know, I mean, there's, there's, uh, I think skateboards are one of those things where I, I still see young kids doing it, and I don't know, using electronic whatever's that I'm like, no, like, you know what, I am too old for that. I will break a hip. Like, you, yeah. you go ahead and do it. And I'm gonna cheer you on while you do that, but no interest in trying that because I'm in the injury phase of my life. <laughs> you do you, yeah. I am. <laughs> I have a bit of the same problem as someone who's doing a lot of dangerous sports like wrestling and grappling in general. So I, my body isn't what it used to be. Uh, well, one related thing, which I think is really, really important to address is many people on the, let's say on the older age of the spectrum, I'm 45, so I'm starting to place myself around that area. When placed in a group of younger people tend to be very, very defensive. Uh, because, you know, they're, everything new is not good to them. And, but that's really just a defensive mechanism. How do you start processing that as a group? Like, how do you help someone 
stop saying no to everything just because it's now that they used to do it. Yeah, it's um, really the uh, the super weapon is is curiosity, and um, the the I've I've seen a there's a there's a gentleman um, who's who's being in the space where I work named Pete Richardson and, and Pete's above 60, right? I don't, I don't know exactly how old Pete is, but he is the most authentically curious individual I've ever seen and just won't assume, will always ask questions and, and ask questions no matter where it where it's from. So both parties, uh, the younger generation generally will have quite a bit of curiosity. They'll ask a question. And that question isn't to say, hey, 40-year-old, hey, 50-year-old, I don't think you know what you're doing and I'm challenging you. It's a, hey, like, to take the question at face value, well, well, why do we do it that way? Hmm. They want to know why we do it that way. That's not a, like, hey, I think this way is dumb or I think we should change it. They're seeking to understand. And so if we can just embrace that adage, you know, seek first to understand, then to be understood, it removes a lot of those barriers. So when there's a question, take the time to answer it. Because I, I believe it was Einstein. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. So just leaning in and saying, hey, great, there's curiosity. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. You you create some alignment. Um, a lot of the times, some of these challenges that you're mentioning can be around creating a plan for whatever it is, right? A, a go-to-market plan or a plan around product development or just a, a plan for the week. And that 40, 50-year-old leader can come in and has a plan in their mind and they come into the planning meeting and dictate the plan. You can create a lot better plans instead of being so speed-driven where it's, hey, how can we get to the plan done as quick as possible? Just circle the room. Like, hey, here's like, where do you feel like we're at? Where do you feel like we're at? Where do you feel like we're at? Where do I feel like we're at? Get that perspective down. Everybody can be aligned around the perspective, which creates alignment, right? When everyone understands, everybody's on the same page. And then the plan that was obvious to them, you can say, okay, well, if we're here and we're tasked by shareholders, whatever, to be over here, how do we think we can get there? Oh, well, we'll have to do this. We'll have to do this. And then it's not my plan or Luca's plan. It's our plan. Everyone owns it. Um, and you see this in, in Western philosophy over and over again. We're too speed driven. And if we slow down and take a more perspective based approach, you can you can create quite a bit of alignment around that. And that's uh, that's important. Yeah, I feel like as a I have so I work, I've worked in sales engineering for a while now, but as a former engineer, I'm I'm a classically trained engineer, as I term myself. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, the uh, importance of achieving consensus of what we're going to do before you start working on it is never wasted time. When you get to the actual technical part of writing the code and getting it to run, if everybody has a clear understanding of what's trying to have, what we're trying to do, it will actually go much faster. So the total time is not wasted on the total time figuring out what we're going to do is not wasted. Many teams have this uh, reflex just going, like, let's just do it. And mm -hmm. there's a middle ground where either you talk about it too much to the point where words lose meaning. That's another problem. But more commonly, people will just start doing the thing. And then it's not complete. It's not. So, yeah, I think I think you really agree that getting consensus from everybody, including the people that you, I don't want to say this, but people you think should not be asked about their opinion, right? It's weird. Mm -hmm. It happens. So there's a team, maybe some people are more involved. Everybody should have a say. Well, and, and everybody is going to have perspective and, and breakthrough in an organization really comes horizontally. So if operations can talk to finance, can talk to customer service, can talk to sales, can talk to account management, can talk to executive, right? If, if you can create a space where everyone can cross communicate, that's when you get those breakthrough aha moments, right? So that operation says, well, it has to be this way, but then sales can say, well, okay, so like you're the operations guy. I understand. I'm not telling you that it, how to program, but the customers don't care about this way. 
they're asking for this and this. So here's the opportunities. Help me understand how that's going to solve this. And then suddenly you get it around. And the, the, the opposite is true, right? If the sales rep promises the moon and operation says, you, you promise this, this is what the conversations are. These are the expectations that are coming in, but we're here or over here. And you're creating gaps. And, and how do we solve for that? then you can come up with a collective plan, right? And it's not like a you're, like Bob the sales rep, you're the problem. It's, hey, when sales happens, here's the expectation and our customers are upset. How do we solve for that? Here's what operations is capable of doing. Okay, well, sales can change to, to like, let's change the script and talk about that and vice versa. And so just, again, getting getting people into a room all perspectives are valid just because there's a perspective error doesn't mean it has to be acted on but yeah. then the perspective's been aired and everybody wants to be heard i feel like i like the idea of almost the departments presenting to each other like if i'm i'm in marketing i'm usually doing my own thing i have points of contacts with finance and sales and not maybe not much with, for engineering but once in a while, you should get the leadership from marketing to just present to the company, like, here's what marketing does. And then you can show numbers, you can show ideas. And it's really, it's really a great idea. Because what I think is a variation on the communication breakdown that we talked about earlier is uh, departments going off doing their own thing after the initial discussion. We all agree on what needs to be done. Great. We don't see each other for months. And that's where things start going slightly sideways. A hundred percent agree. Uh, if if we're uh, if we're all operating in a silo or in a vacuum, that's where miscommunication and misaligned expectations happen. And and so, not only should there be presentations to each other, there should the leadership of those teams should be communicating with each other routinely. Marketing should be talking with engineering all the time not necessarily about marketing or about engineering but about the company as a whole and, and so getting a collaborative leadership approach towards planning and operating the business makes it so that the business functions better so you gotta broaden the room unfortunately and, and a lot of people don't like that <laughs> yeah it is uh i find so guilty of start with engineering uh, from the engineering side engineering often has the problem of not wanting to Brought in the room because we have a GitHub repo full of tickets, and those tickets need to be worked through, and we need to get through mm -hmm. five of them today. And we we have one more meeting; one of those tickets won't get done. So we'll talk tomorrow, and tomorrow turns into next month, and next month turns into I haven't seen the marketing people in three years. <laughs> so that's right. Have seen, I've I've overheard heard something like that. Not at our company, but a different company. I've overheard someone from engineering saying they haven't spoken to marketing in three years which i don't think it's even possible like the never <laughs> that's um but i it's like it can happen right the um i i'm not going to be able to remember who has uh who who shared the perspective with me but in business what is urgent is rarely important to the business and what is important to the business is never urgent so yeah. like in in my background, an example helps out with this. In my background, running an IT service provider, a customer's server goes down. Well, that's an urgent issue. But when it comes to the importance of running an IT services provider company, that's Tuesday. A down server is routine as heck. Like you know what to do. You know how to triage it. You know, like... There's backups, you, you follow checklists, you follow procedures, like that's a run of the mill activity. You don't want them to happen and you do whatever you can to make it not happen, but that's routine. It's urgent, but it's not functionally important to the business. When it's, when it's done, it's done. There is no impact to the business outside of work, but setting up the system on how to deal with a down server, that's critically important. But it's not urgent. Like everything will take its place because, oh, we got to go fight this fire. We got to go fight this fire. And so really the, the, the maturity 
in leadership and even down to the, the, the mid-level leaders and those functional subject matter experts, you have to carve out time routinely that's preserved to work on the important because otherwise the urgent will always drown it out. And that's how you like stay in that whitewater, uncomfortable churny area where things just aren't working optimally. That's because we haven't spent the time building systems and processes to eliminate that variability. You know, I think you're really hitting the point. It is, uh, it's really about have so the systems analogy is perfect. Many, many companies are running five or six servers and they're, they're being, they've been stood up by hand. They work well. One of them goes down, you have config to sort of restore them, but you never get to the point where you're handling the auto scaling properly. It took us a while to, I'll be honest, it took us a while to. Now we have it working perfectly, but, and because, you know, why do I still have those customers only? I don't need auto scaling. If they ca- if a new customer comes on, they take three months before they start using the system. So engineering is plenty of time to stand up the seventh server. So it never happens. Then it's eight, then it's ten. Then you have a hundred customers who run on their own server, and you still don't have config management in place to make sure everything keeps running. Because it's never urgent, you're right. It's mm-hmm. are customers happy? Yes. Are we making money? Yes. So why spend effort? The reason is because yep. you, you will need it eventually. Yep. And by the time it becomes urgent and important, now it's now it's a crisis, right? Like what when when you when you're at two million or four million and you have a problem and you grow to forty million, that problem is ten times as impactful. Oh yeah. So you really want to try to set it up and and, and start iterating and fixing it early so that you can you're not having to start from zero with a $40 million problem. You're starting from 80% and you just got to fix the lat. Well, here's the two things that don't work anymore. Great. That's a lot better than blank sheet of paper on, on system and process design that we should have built 10 years ago. Well, Ian, thank you for joining us today. It was a real pleasure talking about communications in companies. And I think there's a lot of food for thought in what we discussed and Hopefully, I mean, people will enjoy it and we'll, uh, maybe we can do another segment uh, a few months in the future, look into the more financial aspects of startups, because that's always something that people don't really understand either. And they feel like there's never enough content. But first of all, thank you for joining us today. Oh, yeah, it was my privilege, Luca. Thanks for having me on. It was, uh, it was great to come on and talk to the audience. Thank you. So, Ian Richardson from the Fox and Crowd Group uh, LLC joined us today. And, uh, well, thank you again. And for the rest of the people, I'll see you next week. Goodbye.